It's 10.07. BS Radio Mystery Theater presents... is described by Webster as that which is not to be apprehended or understood, that which is beyond the scope of plain understanding. Now, the simplest forms of life know certain things, how to feed, how to propagate, without the least desire to learn how or why. More complex animals grasp more difficult problems till today. There are monkeys who can communicate with us in sign language. But only man, restless, greedy, and complex man, persists in trying to comprehend everything. Wake up. Wake up. Mm, What? Nobody needs you here anymore, nurse. Nobody what? He has seen the great light. He is submerged in it. He is dead. mystery drama, The Glass Bubble, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Terry Keene. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Will man ever be satisfied Will he ever stop asking how and what and why and wherefore? Will he ever call a halt to his search for the total knowledge that he believes will bring him total power? The answer is no, never. He will know it all, even if it kills him. I'm all curled up inside my glass bubble, thinking what to do now. Of course, to other people, my glass bubble would seem to be just a room. A little room only eight feet square with white walls, white ceiling, a white chenille rug on the white floor, a white bed with a white cover, a little white chest next to the bed with a white reading lamp on it. And my white telephone. I've lived in this room since I was a tiny baby, and that was 43 years ago. I call it my glass bubble because of something Strindberg wrote that I've always remembered. Living alone in a single room produces a strange feeling of almost morbid intensity. Like being inside a glass bubble. So you see? It was in this very room snuggled on this very bed when at the age of 28, I woke in the middle of the night with the certain knowledge that my father, who had been ill for quite a long time, was dead. I got out of my bed. I walked down the corridor to his bedroom. I opened the door. I switched on the light, and I walked over to the big chair where his night nurse was snoozing. I shook her very gently. Wake up. Wake up. Mm, What? Nobody needs you anymore, nurse. What is it? You're discharged, as of now. But I was... You can go home and don't come back. But I... My father has seen the great white light. He... He what? He is submerged in it. He is one with it. He is dead. Then I went back to my room, my glass bubble, and laid down on the bed. I left it to the nurse to rouse my sister Joan. In my glass bubble, I waited for the feeling of morbid intensity to return. 
which about daybreak it did. And I reached for my phone, which by now, thank heaven, was not in use. Yes? Hello? This is Doris, Tom. Oh. Oh, yes. What is it? Is something wrong? Nothing's wrong. It's not even six o'clock, Doris. I know. I wouldn't have called you, but it's urgent. Father's dead, Tom. What? Your father? He died a couple of hours ago. Oh, you poor kid. Honey, I'm sorry. I need to see you. Of course. But I'll throw on some clothes and I'll come right over. Uh, No, don't do that. Uh, John's been calling everybody. The house will start to fill up any minute. What do you want me to do? I want you to stay right where you are. I'll come to you. I'll be right over. I pulled on some boots, threw my fur coat over my nightdress, and crept out of the house. I had come to the crossroads of my life. I'd known for years, 23 years to be exact, since the age of five, that there would be a break in my life sooner or later, and that when that break came, I would have to choose. Well, it had come. There in my glass bubble, in that particular state of intensity, I had made my choice. I pulled up in front of Tom's cottage. I got out and walked up to his door. I had never been more sure of myself, what I had to do. Come in, come in, come in. Gosh, I've been so worried. Poor baby. You want something? A drink? Coffee? I made coffee. No, I don't want anything, thank you, Tom. Well, sit down anyway. Here, here, here. Sit down. I don't need to sit down. I won't be staying long. No, I, I suppose you have to get back. When, uh... When did it happen? At three minutes past four. Three minutes past... You were there? You were with him uh, when it happened? No, I was in my room. Oh, the nurse... The nurse was asleep. Well, who was with him? I mean, uh, three minutes past four, if if the nurse was asleep. How do you know? Who told you? Nobody had to tell me. No, but Doris... I simply knew. I mean, you couldn't know. Of course I could. Darling, how? I was asleep in my room, fast asleep. At three minutes past four, my eyes flickered open. On the instant I was awake, I saw him. Who, darling? You saw who? My father. No. No. First, I saw the great light, the great white and luminous light filling the room... Filling the world. Filling all space and everything beyond. Well, the, the moonlight, darling. There was no moon. There weren't even any stars. No, there was just this great light. This gigantic radiance. And my father staring into it. Bright as it was. He didn't even blink his eyes. No, he moved forward. He moved into it. And it swallowed him up. I, uh, I don't know what to say to you, Doris. Uh, There's nothing for you to say. Oh, I, I wish I could understand you. Well, then listen, and I'll try to make you understand. What happened a few hours ago, it's not the first time such thing has happened to me. When I was five years old, now that's the first time I remember There may have been many instances before that. One day, our family cat was missing. (laughs) He was a dear cat. We all loved him very much. And there was a big outcry from my father, my mother. Even the cook was upset and the housemaid, too. Everyone but me. You uh, weren't upset? No. Because in my little white room, lying on my little white bed, I could see the cat quite clearly. And I went to my mother and I said, Don't cry, mother. The cat is smashed flat on Oak Street in front of the fish market. It must have been the way I said it because she went right over to the fish place and there was the cat in the middle of the street, run over by a car. Smashed flat. That's... That's quite a story. 
And I was ten when Joan was born. Prematurely, you know. No, I... I didn't know. Oh, yes. They didn't think she'd live. But one day, in my little room, I could see her laughing and cooing and holding out her little arms. And I went to my mother and I said, Don't worry, Mother. Joan's going to be all right. And my mother gave me a funny look. Maybe she remembered about the cat. I don't know. Anyway, a few days later, Joan was out of danger. Hasn't had a sick day since. What do you think of that? I I don't know what to think. It was while I was lying in my little white room that I realized this was a year or so later that my mother was losing her mind. Now, I didn't tell anybody about that. It didn't seem the kindly thing to do. But a year later, they had to put her away. So, you see how it is. No, no, I, oh, I don't. Oh, Tom. Not, it's so obvious. It isn't obvious You've to me. You've heard of the psi faculty, haven't you? I've heard of it. I've got it. Are you telling me you're psychic? Is that it? Everyone is psychic, Tom. Potentially psychic. Not me. Oh, no. Everyone. Tom, the mind is limitless. Don't you know that? Not so Limitless mind. and filled with energy. Filled to overflowing. But most people waste this beautiful energy. They let it stagnate. Instead of freeing it. Letting it flow out and out. I have to stick with reality. But reality is energy. Don't you see that? Reality is energy and only energy. Energy. Pure and simple. Not to me. Do you know that I often go alone to the theater or to concerts or to the moving pictures? Not because I care about the plays or the music or the film. No. Just to soak up all the wasted energy from the foolish, heedless people around me who are wasting theirs. No, I, I, I didn't know. Well, how could you? Nobody knew. I never told anybody. Because I had to be sure. Sure of what? That my energy, my side quality was strong enough to use for the good of mankind. Tonight, when I woke up in my little room and knew for a certainty that my father had just died and went to his room and found him dead, even then, I wasn't quite sure. Not quite. So I went back to my glass bubble. That's what I call my room. And I stretched out on the bed. And lying there, the certainty grew in me. Grew. Grew and grew till it took over my mind, my body, my soul, my entire being. And I knew with such positiveness, such assurance, that's when I called you. Knew what? What did you know? That you and I, my dear, can never be married. I felt sorry for Tom, I suppose. I'd been the only woman in his mundane, circumscribed life. He'd adored me, given me all his respect, his admiration, his love. And I? What had I given in return? Nothing. Not really. But tolerance and permission to worship me. Poor Tom. Poor, good, loyal, tender devoted Tom. Yes, I tried to feel sorry for him. I really did try. And I almost succeeded, but my mind was too full of the glorious adventures that lay in store for me. I couldn't, I simply couldn't waste any of my precious energy on him. As I lie here now, in my glass bubble, looking back on that momentous decision of mine 25 years ago, I realized how very wise I was. Because the following year, 
Tom married my sister, Joan. How very strange are the ways of destiny. How little we know of the vicissitudes of life. How ignorant we are of the wisdom of our decisions, or even why we make them as we do. No wonder that sometimes it seems better just to stand still. I shall be back shortly with Act Two. So inventive, so resourceful have our technologists become in the last few decades that the rest of us gasp with admiration and even awe. But we gasp with something else, and that is fear and a feeling of impotence. We cannot cope with this strange new world. Small wonder that so many of us want nothing more than to be told what to do. We feel we can no longer control, nor do we wish to control our own lives. It's too difficult. Huddled here in my glass bubble, I think back 25 years to the wedding of Tom and Joan. Mr. and Mrs. Struthers. Handsome Tom, adorable Joan. Ideal couple right out of a magazine, the classy kind. I performed my duties as maid of honor, smiled and said appropriate things, knowing that once this charade was over, I could come back here to my little room. I saw little of the storybook couple after that. I had no wish to, and probably they felt the same way. They thought me strange, and I thought them ridiculous. They went their way, and I went mine. Until a week ago. Who is it? I said, who is it? Go away, please. I don't permit dogs here. Doris, it's Joan. Joan? Your sister. Let me in. Have you got a dog with you? You won't hurt. Come on, Doris. Open the door. No, if you're sure... What an ugly black thing. Tom. So big. It's so black. Are you going to let us in? Both of you? I never go anywhere without him. And vice versa. Well? Why why did you come here? Let us in and I'll tell you. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Come on, baby. (laughs) Baby? You call that big black thing baby? Oh. Are you staying long? I've left, Tom. Your what? His jealousy was unbearable. What did he have to be jealous about? Can I help it if I'm attractive to men? What men? Oh, Terry and Dwight and Martin. Any man, all of them. Men I don't even know. He's jealous of the way they look at me on the street. In restaurants, any place. And every time one of them phones me, oh, my dear, what scenes. Well, are you going to give me a cup of tea or something? Oh, it will come in the kitchen. I'll give you some tea, and then you can figure out what you're going to do. Where you're going to live. Why, here. I'm going to live here, with you. Where else would I live? I was horrified, aghast. The very thought of anyone invading my privacy, encroaching on my solitude, it was unbearable. The fact that this was my sister, I hardly knew her anymore. She was Mrs. Tom Struthers. Her life was a world apart from mine. And mine, what did she know of my life? What could she know? What did I want her to know? Nothing. Now I have to have her here with this huge black hairy monster constantly at her side? No. I could not endure it. Now there's your tea. Drink up and then call Tom and tell him you're coming back. You have a phone? Of course I have a phone. There's one on the wall over there and there's an extension upstairs. Uh, See that you use this one. Why this one? Because the other one is in my room and I don't allow anyone in my room. Why not? Because I don't. 
Now finish your tea and then call Tom. I can't. Doris, I I can't go back to him. I really can't. How can I make you understand? You've never had men interested in you. Do I have to remind you that Tom was interested in me? Oh, years ago. Uh, that he only married you after I turned him down? Did you really turn him down? I always wondered. Well, I did. Why did you? Not that he's anything special. Tom is a very good man. I simply had other things to do with my life, which did not include marriage. Let me stay for, for a day or two at least. Out of the question. Well, till I can make other arrangements. What sort of arrangements? Well, I could uh, go to a hotel, perhaps. Do that. I can't. Not right away. Why not? Why not this afternoon? Because I'm expecting some calls. Everybody thinks I'm staying here with you. Everybody? You told everybody you were staying with me? Not everybody. Just a few people. Who, for instance? Jack and Marty and Charles. Men. All men? Doris, I can't help it if I have this this fascination for men. I suppose I'm what they call a femme fatale. It's not my fault. Then Tom's right. No, no. You have been playing around. Oh, no, I wouldn't. Tom's got every right to be jealous. He hasn't. I swear to you, he hasn't. It's just that they run after me all the time. You mean they'll be calling here? They might. I can't have it. For a week. A few days. Oh, let me stay overnight. At least you can let me stay overnight. Oh, Doris, I'm your sister. You're the only person I can turn to. Please, just till tomorrow. You've got plenty of room. Please, just for tonight. How about the dog? We'll be good. He'll be quiet. Oh, please. Well, you can have Father's old room. Don't you sleep there? It's the best room in the house. I have my own. The one I had when I was little. That dinky little room. It suits me. I gave her Father's room and she and her big black dog settled in. The dog behaved well, I have to admit that. He simply followed her around. But he was not quiet. Every time the phone rang, he barked and barked and barked till Joan answered it. And an hour after her arrival, it started ringing. I'll get it. I got it. Yes? Hello. Oh, Stephen, why did you call me? You know I told you not to. Stephen, Jimmy, Marty, Bob, an endless string of phone calls. What was she, this sister of mine? A witch? A sorceress? Or simply a wicked woman? I enclosed myself in my glass bubble oftener each day. And for longer periods of time. I began to be fascinated by these phone calls. And I began to pay them strict attention. The pattern was always the same. I'll get it. I got it. Yes? Oh, Andy. Oh, she was clever. Feline and clever. And my glass bubble was not having its old effect on me. I could not attain that state of morbid intensity. I was too distracted, too distraught. The sound of that provocative little voice stirred memories in me. It was becoming unbearable. And I had to do something. I went to see Tom Struthers. Why, Doris, this is a surprise. Come in, come in. I have to talk to you, Tom. What's the matter? Are you all right? Uh, you know your wife is staying with me. Oh, is she? Oh, I thought she might go to you. Tom, I know about your jealousy. She told me. My jealousy? Oh, my dear, you can't be blamed for it. Oh, well, that's nice to know. You have no idea what it's been like since she's moved in with me. Men have been calling her at all hours of the day and night. I don't know who they are, but there must be dozens of them. Really? The phone rings, the dog barks, Joan rushes to the phone. It's another one. 
what I mean. The way she talks, so coy and so kittenish, leading them on, but never really saying anything. You know what I mean? I know, I know very well. You mean they've called her here? In your very own house? Oh, yes. Oh, poor Tom. Well, no wonder you were jealous. Who could blame you? I wasn't jealous. Well, you must have been. You had every reason to be. Joan was. But I wasn't. Joan was jealous. What did she have to be jealous of? You know. No, I don't. You must know. Don't tell me you don't know. You know what? That I've never stopped being in love with you. In love? In love with me? Or the memory of you. You mustn't say such things. Tom, no. Now, it can't be. It's been 25 years. We've hardly seen each other. I have a very good memory. Look, we will forget you've said any of this. Forget I ever came here. Forget it all. I will go back to my place and I'll tell Joan to come back to you. But I don't want her back. You must. You must. You will straighten everything out. Now, I'm sure there's a way. No, please, please don't come near me. Don't touch me. Don't. Don't. We will forget that. drove home too fast, too recklessly, my emotions in turmoil, my heart racing, all with confusion. Tom had not been jealous. Tom had loved me. I drove faster and faster and more and more recklessly, but somehow I reached home safely and let myself in, only to hear the familiar sound. desire to be so possessed, but it is becoming more and more apparent that a great many people gladly surrender to outside authority and willingly, even eagerly, abdicate their autonomy. Self-possession has become for them an unbearable burden. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. talking before about being self-possessed. This is not quite the same thing as being self-sufficient. One self cannot live happily without other selves with whom to share the fancy business of living. But sharing is not the same as owning or being owned. One must belong to no one and nothing but oneself. Or what one shares with other selves is worth little or nothing at all. Curled up here in my glass bubble, my knees pulled up to my chin and my eyes closed tight. I strive with all my will to induce the feeling of morbid intensity that Strindberg described and so often experienced in his own glass bubble. It will not come. Memories. My mind flits across that last meeting with Tom when he said he'd loved me all those 25 years. The 
that he cared not a fig whether Joan returned to him or not. I remember leaving him and driving furiously home and hearing Joan on the phone in the kitchen. Yeah? Hello? Oh, Tom. Tom, I can't come back to you. No, Tom. No! And I remember, too, with a sharp stab of pain, my certain knowledge that my sister was possessed. After that shattering moment of truth a week ago, I retired to my little room, to my glass bubble. I never left it. And the telephone rang several times each day. And the dog barked. And Joan rushed to the kitchen phone. And her soft, seductive voice floated up to me. upon me. Every nerve quivered. Every sense was sharp, acute. I reached out my hand to the white telephone on the little white bedside stand. I had to know who it was that Joan was lying to this time. Softly. Stealthily. I lifted the receiver of my white telephone and put it to my ear. fell from my hand. There was no second voice on the line. Joan was speaking to a voiceless being, a creature only she could hear. She was still talking to the voiceless entity when I crept out of the house, got into my car, and drove cautiously, deliberately this time, to Tom's cottage. Doris, you came back. No, Tom, don't come closer. But I'm... I have something of the utmost importance to tell you. All right, all right, darling. Sit down and tell me. I will try to be brief. It will take as long as you like. Uh, no, I must tell you quickly because I have to get back. Joan is possessed. Possessed? Possessed? Oh, come on now, darling. Listen to me. When I went home after that last time, I saw you. When I walked into the house, Joan was on the phone in the kitchen... She was talking to you. To me? I haven't talked to Joan since she walked out on me. That's when I knew she was possessed. She was talking to someone, someone she thought was you. Who could it be? I don't have any idea, and I couldn't care less. Well, I care. She is my sister. So what I did, I shut myself up in my room. I didn't even come out for meals. I told Joan and the servants I had a cold. Then today, half an hour ago, the phone rang. The dog barked, of course. And Joan ran to the phone the way she always does. But this time, I picked up the extension, the phone in my room, and I listened in. Well, who was it she was talking to? No one. No one? No one that could be heard, except by Joan. Doris, what what are you getting at? A disembodied voice. I don't get it, Doris. I really don't. A voice from out there somewhere. Oh, come on now. A demon voice. Doris, And please. who was transmitting the demon voice? Who? The only one who could. The devil. Doris, sweetheart. Doris, baby. Baby, yes, baby. That's what she calls him. What do you mean? Imagine calling the devil baby. You don't mean the dog, do you? Of course I mean the dog. Don't you know that the devil often appears on earth in the shape of a big black dog? Didn't you know that? Uh, I, I don't... To think I let him into my own house, let him stay there, let him sleep in the same room with my sister, let him follow her around wherever she went. Doris, listen. He was so well-behaved. So obedient, so quiet, so well-mannered. 
But that's the way the devil can be when he wants to. I don't think that... Except. The... Except. When the phone rang. Then he would bark. Bark and bark until she'd answer it. He was egging her on, you see? Making her go to the phone. Making her talk to the voiceless demon. Listen, Doris. Tom. You have a gun, don't you? What? I said you have a gun. You do, don't you? Yes, I've got a gun. Well, but... give it to me. What for? What do you want it for? Well, what do you think I want it for? I don't know, Doris. I'm just afraid. I want to shoot the dog, of course. But, Doris... If you knew the devil was in your house, dominating your sister, holding her in thrall, wouldn't you want to kill him? Wouldn't you do it? But you don't actually know. I do know. In my glass bubble, it came to me. I know. Now, give me the gun. Here's the gun. Thank you. You know how to use it? I know enough. Thank you, Tom. Wait, wait a minute, Doris. Thank you very much. A gun is nothing to fool around with. Doris! I drove home with Tom's gun in my pocket. Everything was becoming crystal clear in my mind. I pulled up at the house opened the door and went in. Of course, the first thing I heard was Joan's voice. I'd expected that. And I smiled to myself as I made my way to the kitchen. Yes, there she was, with the devil huddled close to her legs. But what can I do? I'm a married woman. <laughs> oh, really? You mustn't say things like that. Hang up the phone. Uh, what? Oh, just a second, Harry. My sister just came in. Hang up the phone. Tell Harry you can't talk to him anymore. Harry, I have to hang up. My sister wants to talk to me. Well, what is it, Doris? Sit down, Joan. All right. Sit. Baby, sit. That's a good boy. Must that dog sit so close to you? That's where he always sits. You know that. He wouldn't sit anyplace else. Who? You just try moving him. You'll see. Joan, there's something I have to do. I'm sorry, my dear. No. You're going to ask us to leave, baby and me? No, not that. You mean we don't have to leave? You don't have to. Just him. You are possessed by him. But I love him. You love the devil. The devil? My baby. Your baby is the devil. He has taken over your being. He has deluded your poor mind. He has come into this house disguised as a black dog. It's an old trick of his. But this time he won't get away with it. Doris, what are you going to do? Sit very still, Joan. No. The door chimes startled me. I turned and ran for the stairs. The chimes pursued me up the stairs, all the way to my glass bubble. I threw myself on the bed. The chimes had stopped. But I heard a banging on the front door. I heard a voice. A dear, familiar voice. Open the door! It's Tom! Open the door! Let me in! I could not concentrate. I could not induce the feeling of morbid intensity. I buried my head in the pillow, but it was no use. My glass bubble was failing me. Then I heard the crashing of the front door. Now it's all right. Now the mood is taking over. Now I know what to do. Here in my glass bubble, everything is coming clear. Oh. Oh, look. See there. It's the great light. It's coming closer. It's filling the room. Oh, great radiant light.
there too late. I found Joan in the kitchen, sitting in a chair, the dog beside her. She had a bullet through her head. Upstairs, I found Doris. The coroner called it heart failure. What else could he call it? Everybody dies of heart failure, right? As long as your heart beats, you're alive. Am I right? Yes, yes, sure, I'm right. Oh, uh, the dog. The dog was okay. I brought him home with me. We're getting to be real pals. Since I'll never get married again, he's good company. The only company I've got, actually. Oh, I suppose you're wondering about those phone calls. No mystery. You dial the operator and ask her to test your phone. You think something may be wrong with it. Hang up. Wait a few seconds. Phone rings. Pick it up. Say thanks. And when she's off the line, you go on talking. So nobody, of course. Very effective if you want to make somebody jealous. Joan used to do it all the time, but it didn't work with me because I still loved Doris. there's no one. Just me and the dog. Tom Struthers is still living in the same house with the big black dog. Folks see them around town now and then, shopping, doing errands. He doesn't speak to anybody. Nobody speaks to him. But the big black dog never leaves his side. Never. And he never barks. Never. I'll be back shortly. At the store, they told me there's a powerful anti-itch drug I can buy without a doctor's prescription. Now, I use Biclozine Cream as directed. No more burning, embarrassing itching. No more scratching. Biclozine actually speeds healing. Biclozine Cream. What a relief. Now... Soften and remove hard, callous skin with the same ingredient doctors use most. Apply Dermasoft Cream to feet, hands, elbows as directed. Dermasoft Cream. Fellow Americans, if you're still shopping here and there and everywhere for shoes, hold it right where you are. Put your feet together, stop running around. Just step around a kitty and you'll cover the ground. Anywhere you want to go, head your feet in our direction. combination of antacid and anti-gas ingredients gives you fast, gentle relief from acid indigestion, heartburn, and gas in just minutes. I like hot dogs, but they don't like me. For occasional use, only as directed. You're walking through a deserted train station to a track that's marked not in service. You have a ticket in your hand, and the destination on it is a date in time. You're about to board the Time Express. You're on a return trip through time to relive a critical moment from your past. What would you do with a second chance? Find out when you board the Time Express. You on CBS Television, Thursday night at 8, 7 Central and Mountain. The other day, somebody told me he thought he'd heard a sort of muffled bark that seemed to come from inside Tom's house. He thought, too, that he'd heard Tom's phone ring just before. It's occurred to me that after a couple of years, maybe Tom got so lonely that he dialed the operator and asked her to check his telephone. I could be wrong, of course, but I don't really think I am. Our cast included Terry Keene, Patricia Elliott, and Tony Roberts. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until...
Until next time... 